Deeper Dance with your host Yasmina Ramsey, where we explore how world dance expresses the inexpressible and helps us to understand the meaning of our existence. Welcome to the first episode of Deeper Dance. I am your host Yasmina Ramsey. In the coming weeks of Deeper Dance, I will talk to different dance artists in different forms of dance from around the world. Many of these artists work for community outreach, or they have a socio-political message, or they're exploring through creativity the meaning of existence through their dance form, or all of the above. My dance career spans 40 years. It's been primarily in one style of dance called Middle Eastern Dance or Raksharki, which means Oriental or Eastern Dance. One of the forms or styles of dance that I do that's the most popular is often referred to as belly dance. I try not to use this term because of the preconceptions associated with it are often not closely or anywhere related to what I actually do. I will talk more about this later in this episode. But for now, I want to say that over these 40 years, I have also created three large world dance festivals that presented music and dance from many multicultural forms of dance. Also, for five years, I ran a monthly series called DanceNet. Each month, we presented different soloists and ensembles, about 10 performances all together each month over the five years. I had a motto for DanceNet, and that was, if its body's moving, it belongs on the DanceNet stage. So it was very democratic. The purpose of presenting world dance, as is this podcast, is manifold. But primarily, I'd look for ways to get out of my own bubble, to explore and find new ways to see my own dance form. And I believe that all of us dancers can really learn and make our own dance form or our own way of expression richer and more creative if we learn about other forms. Each form has a different way of expression, but also has a different history, a different culture, a different story, a different way of approaching the body, a different way of moving through the body, a different way of moving through space. And each one can lend to our own dance forms to cause us to have much richer expression. Also, we learn about the world. We learn about other people, other cultures, other ways of existence, other states of mind, other attitudes, other opinions, other ways of life, other ways of looking at the universe and looking at our daily lives. So I feel it's really great to get out of our bubble sometimes and listen to the stories of other dancers. So we can always relate to them because they're another dance artist. So we relate to them on a very deep level, but they have a completely different story to tell, a completely different way that they approach dance. And that's always fascinating. And it can help us become richer and better dancers ourselves. Also, I'm a really curious person. I enjoy hearing the stories of others. And even in the first few interviews I've done for Deeper Dance, I've learned so much about my own art form, about myself, and about new ways to approach my own art form. So far, I've interviewed five guests, and there's many more lined up in many different styles of dance. The ones coming up are break dance, East Indian dance, native dance, contemporary dance, ballet, the Hakka from New Zealand, and many fascinating interviews. But right now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the first five interviews that I've done, and the first interview in a way, which is myself. So in order for you to know a little bit about me, and know my story, and how it led to this podcast, and how it led to these artists that I want to interview, I'll read you my bio. Uh, In the third person because I find it embarrassing to do it in the first person. (laughs) So since 1981, Yasmina Ramsey has created over 200 ensemble choreographies for 25 dance companies in the USA and Canada. 
She has produced seven large international dance festivals. That's not including the world dance festivals. So that would be ten dance festivals or conferences altogether, featuring discussion and debate concerning Middle Eastern dance while presenting over 1,000 international solo and ensemble dance artists and over 50 master teachers such as Dina Talat, Mahmoud Reda, Mohammed Khalil and Aida Noor. Yasmina received her essential training from various teachers in Egypt and in Syria. She has taught in more than 65 cities around the world. Yasmina has performed extensively in the Middle East, primarily with the master musicians of Syria. She has created 10 full-length, six-day productions with as many as 45 dancers and musicians at a time. And her dance company, in small form or large, has toured in the USA, Greece, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and all across Canada. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my first five interviews that are coming up in the coming weeks. One lovely young lady named Mirvet was born and raised in Syria. She was originally a gymnast, and then she auditioned for Syria's largest dance company called the Inanna Ballet Company. There she learned ballet and folklore dances of the Middle East. The Inanna Dance Company toured around the world. It also came to Canada in my city in Toronto, where they had 100 dancers while on tour. So it was a very large company. And then the war happened in Syria, so her fellow dance artists and family members became dispersed and are now living in different countries. Mirvet herself ended up living in Dubai. Along that journey, she has uh, competed and made to the finals for So You Think You Can Dance in Lebanon. And she also competed in Arabs Got Talent. When she did Arabs Got Talent, she decided to try a style of dance that she felt was closest to her heart. She had been studying hip-hop and jazz and ballet and folklore, as well as contemporary dance. And for her, contemporary dance really spoke to her. Unfortunately, the audiences did not understand this form of dance. They were not familiar with it, and so it was not as well received. And it was disappointing for her. Many comments were made, basically making fun of what she was doing. But she loves this dance to today, and she hopes that eventually she will be able to travel to different cities and learn from master teachers of contemporary dance. While she's in Dubai, she's teaching many, many students, many styles of dance, but in particular, contemporary dance. So I hope you enjoy Mirvet. All of the guests are amazing. And another guest is Matthew. You'll see later in the podcast how I found out about Matthew. He's an extraordinary young man who's doing wonderful things for voguing, vogue dance. Matthew is taking voguing from the ballrooms and the community venues that it's usually performed in to the mainstream theatrical stages. He's very excited about this, and I know from my past experience what a trial that can be. <laughs> that mostly was my work of 40 years. So he's a very dynamic uh, performer, a very dynamic person, and I think he's really, really going to go far. And he has a fascinating dance form that has a fascinating history behind it, which I think everybody could benefit from learning. Jacia, another wonderful young woman, who does a lot of community outreach. All of her projects are either trying to bring the community of dance in which she works in together, the members of it. She works towards the idea of people working together rather than in competition. She also started a program specifically geared for young girls between ages 9 and 12. In this program, she uses dance as a vehicle for their self-esteem, um, particularly to do with their bodies and their femininity and their sexuality. So as they go into their teenage years, they can feel empowered and strong to face the world that teenage girls need to face these days. Meher lives in India, and Meher does the same form of dance as I do, which is raksharki or belly dance. And when she initially started it, it was not well received in India at all. I was very much misunderstood. Again, another story I can completely relate to from my dance form 40 years ago. And she has worked very hard to establish it on main stages and built a big school there that teaches 
that teaches Middle Eastern dance for all ages. She was also featured on um, India's Got Talent and became a huge phenomena overnight because of that show. And another guest who's probably very important to this podcast because she has her own podcast and she helped me along the way, giving me some advice, especially the technical things, which is so not my arena. <laughs> anyway, her name is Francesca. And Francesca also is in my form of dance, belly dance. She used it to form an organization that has become a worldwide phenomenal. It started with dance mobs or flash mobs. And they were raising money and awareness for domestic abuse. So at each flash mob, there's pamphlets given out, information disseminated on this subject to help particularly women, but anybody who has suffered from domestic abuse. Over the years, she found out that actually she herself was in a relationship that involved domestic abuse that she was being abused at the time and hadn't even realized it. And then as years went on, she found that many of the dancers who came to Chimmy Mob originally came to dance and enjoy the event, but stayed because of the cause. And now Francesca has decided that the efforts will not be so much towards helping those who have been abused, but rather preventing it from happening in the first place. So there's constant posts every day about things to look for so that you can know that you're in an abusive relationship before it gets too late. I found these wonderful artists fascinating. I really enjoyed my conversations with them and I'm really looking forward to the lineup of interviews that are coming. And so now speaking to my story a little bit, my art form, my dance form called Raksharki or Middle Eastern dance or belly dance. This dance form is very sensual and very feminine. And this can sometimes cause a variety of reactions. Either people giggle or they're horrified or they completely love it and think it's so beautiful. No matter what it is, there's usually some kind of reaction, some of it based on preconceptions, some of it based on just seeing the movement and what it brings up in people. And over the years, my loved ones and friends around me, because they love me, they're concerned for me in that my art form that I work so hard for and I have devoted my life is still not uh, accepted and perceived in the light that I see it and, or in the light that I try to portray it. So it's often uh, suggested to me, Yasmina, why don't you change, why don't you change what you do? Why don't you add a little more ballet or make it more contemporary dance? Or why don't you add a little bit of hip hop? Or in other words, they want me to change my dance so that I will be accepted and uh, valued more. And I appreciate their concern. But the thing is, I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm not about to change it now. I've been aware of people's attitudes the whole 40 years. I've been aware of this and it's exactly why I've worked so hard is to change that perception. So I would be defeating my own work of the last 40 years if I was to change my dance form. And I feel that people's reaction to this dance form is in part a kind of internalized patriarchy because it's feminine, because it's sensual, and because for, I don't know, maybe the last 5,000 years, for some reason along the line, we've been told that anything feminine and anything sensual or sexual, there's something wrong with it, or it's a sin, or it's something that's not valued. And because of this, people have this reaction to this dance form. I really believe that this art form also has the answers within it to many of the healing of the world's problems right now. I believe that the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the climate change movement, these three movements, among many others, but particularly these three, are caused by a similar sort of fraction or damage that's being done to all of our soul as humanity at some point. And that's our disassociation with the earth, our disassociation with our humanity, and our disassociation with the feminine aspect of our humanity. I'll be speaking more about that in the coming weeks, hopefully. 
And I want to finish this podcast talking a little bit about what we as dance artists all have in common. I read many articles about psychology surveys that say dancers are the most spiritual artists of all the art forms. Even commercial dancers will often say to you that their dance form is their spiritual path for them. So I'll end with these words from Khalil Gibran, where he says, The philosopher's soul dwells in his head. The poet's soul dwells in his heart. The singer's soul lingers about his throat. But the soul of the dancer abides in all of her body. So he now ends the first podcast where I'm a little bit nervous, as you can tell. Hopefully I'll get more relaxed with this as the weeks go on. I hope you'll join me. I hope you'll follow. I hope you'll share. And please uh, be in contact. Email me or get, be in contact on social media. Please tell me if there's anything I can do to improve this podcast or any ideas of people you would like me to interview or dance forms you would like to know more about or how to work with creativity, anything like this that you're interested in, the things that have been said in these podcasts that either upset you or that you love, please give me the feedback so I can know the direction to go towards into the future. I want you to be part of this podcast. I want you to feel involved. I want to have the conversations that you want to hear. So thank you for joining me today. And whatever dance form you practice, I join with you in our efforts to express the inexpressible through our bodies. Thank you for joining me, your host, Yasmina Ramsey, for this week's episode of Deeper Dance. If you would like more information, please check out my website at yasminaramsayarts.com. I hope you join me next week with more fascinating guests and more ideas to ponder inspired by dance. Music